Hi, this is Amr Abdigawad, and this lecture will be part two of back pain in children. In part one, we listed the different causes of back pain in children, and we discussed the general management, uh, general management of uh, children presenting with back pain. Objectives of this lecture are explaining the pathology and clinical presentation of common causes of back pain in children, and we're going to differentiate between those cases that can be managed by the primary care physician from those who require referral for an orthopedic surgeon. A good source that you can use is this book, Pediatric Orthopedic Handbook for Primary Care Physician by myself and Dr. Nagan. After we have discussed the general management of back pain in children, let's speak now about common causes of back pain in children. We'll start with mechanical or muscular back pain, and this is back pain due to muscle strain. Uh, please note that this is a diagnosis of exclusion, so you have to exclude all other pathology uh, by clinical exam and uh, plain radiograph. Uh, it is common in adolescent, uh, and it is rare in children less than 10 years old. And this is the, the most common cause of back pain in adolescent. So muscular back pain is a back pain due to muscle strain. You give that diagnosis after exclusion of other pathologies by exam and re, a plain radiograph. Remember, the diagnosis is common in adolescent and rare in children less than 10 years old, and it is the most common cause of back pain. So what is the treatment of uh, muscular back pain? Uh, local heat, uh, non-steroidal medications like ibuprofen or naproxen, Proxen. Uh, if that does not help the patient, you can proceed to therapy for strengthening of abdominal and back muscle. Uh, remember that you need to strengthen both the abdominal and the back muscle for this uh, uh, back pain. Uh, if the patient is involved in vigorous uh, sports or vigorous activities, decrease these vigorous activities till the pain improve. Using of a back brace is uh, severely controversial. Uh, most uh, surgeons will advise against that. Uh, if the condition persists for um, a few weeks despite adequate treatment, uh, you should proceed to more imaging studies like bone scan or MRI to make sure you're not missing uh, another diagnosis like infection or tumor. Another important uh, cause of back pain in adolescent is the spondylolysis. What is a spondylolysis? Spondylolysis is a bone defect in the pars interarticularis of the vertebra. So this is a normal vertebra. If you see here, this is an L4 vertebra. This is a normal vertebra. And the part which connects between the superior articular facet and the inferior articular facet, this part is called the pars interarticularis. Sometimes a defect happen in that part causes the spondylolysis. So if you see here, this is the L5 vertebra, and this is the pars interarticularis. And if you see, there is a defect here, as you can see by the arrow. So this defect in the pars interarticularis is called spondylolysis. The exact cause of spondylolysis is unknown. It may be a developmental condition, uh, but it also it may represent a stress fracture. That's why we, it's more common in a sport that uh, involve repeated extensions, uh, position of the spine like football, gymnastics, and divers, uh, because the repeated extension causes uh, stress over the pars interarticularis, and with that repeated stress, it may cause spondylolysis. Uh, the condition is common. As we said, it happens in about 7% of all adolescents and in people involved in sports with repeated extension like the sports we said before football gymnastics and divers this condition may goes may go up to 20 percent uh, so again the exact uh, reason for spondylolysis is not known uh, it's a developmental condition but it's more common in people who does repeated extensions like football players and divers uh, as we said, the, the condition is common, is about 7% in adolescent, but the vast majority of the cases are asymptomatic. You discover it when you do an x-ray for a different reason. Also, if you get a patient with back pain and you get an x-ray which show a spondylolysis, however, the pain does not, the clinical picture does not coincide with, spond with the spondylolysis, uh, the pain may be due to a different reason. Uh, it is the most common cause of non-muscular back pain in adolescent. Uh, so the uh, most common cause of, uh, of back pain in adolescent is muscular back pain, and the most common cause of non-muscular back pain is spondylolysis. Majority of the case affect L5, uh, however, less commonly it can affect L4. So uh, lumbar uh, vertebra number five is the most common cause, is the most commonly affected as a vertebra with the spondylolysis, uh, less commonly it can affect the lumbar vertebra number four. 
So what is the clinical presentation of spondylolysis? So the patient will complain of back pain, uh, which increase when he arch back his spine during sports activity. So the pain will be mainly during arching back or extension of the spine. When you examine this patient and ask him to extend his spine, uh, which again, extension of the spine means arching back of the spine, he will uh, uh, experience severe back pain that will radiate to the back of the thigh. So most important thing in the clinical presentation of spondylolysis lysis is back pain uh, with extension of the spine and when you do that test and uh, when you do extension of the spine and um, while examining the patient the patient will experience uh, the pain in his spine and the pain will radiate to the back of the thigh if you do the straight leg raising test the patient will get posterior uh, um, uh, thigh pain however this usually does not extend distal to the knee so it's a sign of hamstring tightness rather than radiculopathy so clinical presentation, most important thing that I want you to remember is pain with extension of the spine. He will com the patient will complain about that, and when you do the exam, patient will experience the pain radiating to the back of the thigh. Let's discuss the imaging of cases of spondylolysis. Uh, as we said, spondylolysis is a common condition. About 7% of the population uh, have a spondylolysis, so it can be found as an accidental finding for x-rays taken for other reason. Uh, in general, spondylolysis can be seen in the lateral view. However, uh, it's more obvious in the oblique view. And in the oblique view, it gives what's known as the Scotty dog with color appearance, as we're going to see here. So this is an oblique picture for the normal spine. This is an oblique picture for patient with spondylolysis. Um, if you see here, this is uh, the oblique pictures of the spine. Here's the superior articular facet here. Here's the inferior articular facet. Here is the area connecting between them. This is the pars interarticularis. Uh, here is the inferior articular process of the other side. Um, here is the other part of the body with the transverse process. This gives you, the, in the oblique view, a picture of a Scotty dog. And if the patient has a defect here in the pars interarticularis, as we see in this picture, uh, he will give you the Scotty dog appearance with collar uh, in the neck. Uh, so in the oblique view, you can see the defect uh, uh, more obvious uh, between the superior and the inferior articular process in the pars interarticularis, and it gives you the picture uh, known as a Scotty dog with color appearance. If you look closely, this is an oblique view. So let's see here, this is an oblique view of L4. You can see here the superior articular process, inferior articular process, uh, the lateral part here. Here is the inferior articular process from the other side. And you can see here that there is no defect here in the middle. Uh, it's continuous. Let's go now to this vertebra. If you can see, here is the superior articular facet. Here is the inferior articular facet. And here is the area in between them. There is a defect there. It looks like a dog with a collar appearance in the neck. So compare between this picture and this picture and uh, look here and this will, that's what's known as the Scotty dog with color appearance. This is a normal vertebra. This is a vertebra with a defect in the pars interarticularis. Also CT scan can show the defect in the pars interarticularis. So this is a case of uh, spondylolysis. If you can see here the lateral view, as we said, sometimes if, if the defect is obvious, you can see it. So here is the pars interarticularis. Here is the pars interarticularis of L5. Uh, and you can see obviously here that there is a defect here, where is the arrow points. Uh, so this is a spondylolysis of the uh, L5 vertebra. So it's a defect in the pars interarticularis. Uh, this is a CT as you can see here this is the axial cut and if you can uh, see here is the axial cut show obviously the defect here and the defect here and this is uh, the uh, Sajda reformat uh, also you can see like this is an intact pars interarticularis uh, this pars interarticularis has the defect here which is uh, you can see obviously where the points arrow. Uh, if you can see here, the edges are very sclerotic. That indicates that this is a chronic condition. It's not an acute and has been going on for a while. Uh, so, um, as we said, imaging studies, the plain X-ray can show it in the lateral view if it's obvious. Uh, it's more obvious to see it in the oblique views. CT scan will show you the, um, the defect in a better way and it also will show if the edges are sclerotic, which means they've been going on for a while. Uh, another way to see if this is an acute or a chronic event uh, is to do uh, the bone scan with a single photon emission uh, computerized tomography or what's known as the SPECT. And this it will uh, help to differentiate between an, 
uh, between acute and chronic lesions uh, because acute lesions uh, will uh, show up as hot uh, lesions uh, in the spine uh, with more uptake. Uh, the chronic lesion will be cold. It means that the uptake of the um, uh, isotopes will be uh, much less. So imaging studies, plain radiograph, lateral view, oblique view, CT scan, and SPECT. So what is the treatment for spondylolysis? So the treatment is mainly conservative and supportive. Um, it's uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications and rest from sport till pain decrease. And uh, uh, you will always be asked this question by the patient, when can I go back to sports? So the answer is that the child uh, can go back to sport when uh, they are pain-free uh, and when uh, they regain their range of motion. Uh, a small brace like lumbar corset can be used if the pain does not improve with rest and non-steroidal uh, for a short time. Uh, if this is an acute lesion, uh, acute event that uh, associated with uh, spondylolysis, uh, they can be treated with more aggressive immobilization, the thoracolumbosacral orthosis or TLSO. Or, um, this is a more involved brace that goes from the uh, upper chest to the sacrum. It can be used if you think that this is an acute lesion. Uh, orthopedic referral, if no improvement, uh, surgery is rarely done in spondylolysis. Uh, there has been some uh, recent debate that um, you can uh, treat them as fractures and fix the uh, defect in spondylolysis. However, the vast majority of um, the pediatric orthopedic and um, uh, spine uh, surgeon uh, will still treat uh, spondylolysis, cons uh, spondylolysis conservative uh, with no surgery. Uh, so, uh, most of the conditions can be treated non-steroidal, rest from sports, and the child can go back to sport when he's uh, pain-free. Um, small uh, lumbar corset can be used in case that the pain does not improve. Uh, more involved with immobilization for acute lesion, orthopedic referral if no improvement with all these measures. After we have discussed spondylolysis, let's speak now about spondylolithesis. So what is spondylolithesis? Spondylolithesis is forward slippage of the vertebra in relation to the vertebra below. So let's see, this is a picture of a spondylolysis. So spondylolysis, as we said, is a defect uh, in the pars interarticularis. However, the vertebra above in relation to the vertebra below are still aligned. When these relations start to disturb and this vertebra start to slide forward by the stresses, that's called spondylolithesis. So if you see here, that vertebra started to slide forward because there is nothing now to prevent her from doing that and this vertebra now became anterior to the sacrum so if you see here the anterior edge here of l5 and s1 are equal like but here the anterior edge of uh, l5 is far anterior to the sacrum so that's called spondylolithesis what is the instance of spondylolithesis? We said that spondylolysis is a common condition. Um, however, it's only 5% of cases of spondylolysis will progress to sp symptomatic spondylolithesis. And um, despite that spondylolysis is common in boys, the high-grade spondylolithesis, the case that really progress forward, uh, are uh, more common in girls. What is the clinical presentation? The clinical presentation of spondylolithesis is very common to spondylolysis. So they will also have back pain with extension activities and there will be more actually hamstring tightness. Advanced cases of spondylolithesis may have radicular symptom. So if you do the straight leg raising test, there will be shooting pain below the level of the knee. The radiograph will show you, as we um, uh, described in the previous picture, it will show you L5 slippage over the sacrum. As we can see in this radiograph, here is the anterior edge of L5. It's not aligned with the sacrum. It's definitely anterior to it. Um, this is actually one of my patients that had a back pain um, and pain increased with extension exercise. He had hamstring tightness. When we got the x-ray, it showed here clearly uh, that L5 uh, had um, uh, slipped forward in relation to the sacrum. Uh, we described the amount of the slippage by the percentage of the vertebra. So it's like in this case, it slipped about 25%. If it slips up to here, it's about 50%. Here, 75%. And here, it's 100% forward slippage. So what is the treatment of spondylolithesis? Uh, spondylolithesis cases has to be referred to an orthopedic surgeon or a neurosurgeon um, because uh, they may need surgical treatment, especially for a high uh, degree slippage, uh, like 75% uh, or 100% uh, slippage. This will need some sort of surgical intervention. And remember, if the patient has more, more than 50% uh, slippage uh, of the vertebral uh, width, um, in case of spondylolithesis, you have to prevent them from going into contact sports.
slipage. So no contact sports if the slippage is more than 50% of the vertebral width. Sherman kyphosis. Now let's discuss another category that can cause uh, back pain in children, which is infections of the spine. We have two main infections of the spine, which is discitis and vertebral body osteomyelitis. Discitis, it means that the inflammation as infection is mainly of the intervertebral disc and is seen more in toddlers uh, as affect mainly the lumbar vertebra. Vertebral body osteomyelitis, that's mainly the infection is in the vertebral body and it starts in the vertebral end plates, which is our superior and inferior vertebral in the place of the vertebra but in most cases there is a combination of discitis and vertebral osteomyelitis and you cannot differentiate completely between them uh, because most of cases has elements of both discitis and vertebral body osteomyelitis so what is the etiology of this infection? It's a hematogenous spread. So it's, it spreads from a distant uh, focus uh, by blood and then it settles either in the disc or in the intervertebral body. Uh, it's mainly staph co uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, that's the most common organism isolated. Uh, however, there may be other organisms that can cause this like uh, Kingella kingi, uh, Strept and E. coli. Let's discuss now the clinical presentation for children with infection of the spine. Uh, back pain is the most important uh, finding. This is the most important uh, presentation. Uh, it's a back pain. Uh, it's not relieved by rest. It can continue at night and during sleep. Um, remember that most patients have mild or no fever. However, older children may get uh, fever and abdominal pain. Uh, but younger children usually have a no or mild fever. Uh, limping is very important or refusal to walk so a child who used to walk before now uh, is refusing to walk or having uh, uh, lots of limping that's also a presentation for patients with a spinal infection um, one of the hallmark of the disease is the spinal motion will be reduced a lot to alleviate the pain. Uh, there will be lots of paraspinal muscle spasm. And remember, this is an infection of the anterior part of the spine. Uh, so uh, flexion will cause more pain. That's why uh, the child will refuse uh, to pick up a, an object from the floor uh, or uh, he will uh, choose to bend his hips and knee and keep his back straight. So spinal motion, it will be limited especially flexion especially flexion uh, will be severely limited in cases of infection of the spine uh, now let's go to the laboratory findings you have to do a complete uh, blood count but that uh, may be uh, normal uh, CBC and ESR are usually mildly elevated uh, blood cultures uh, can be done sometimes they are positive however the most important thing to get the organism is to do an image guided biopsy so if you see this patient having an uh, infection of the uh, uh, disc between L4 and L5 and um, uh, we are taking here as uh, a culture uh, from his spine by uh, image guided uh, to get the organism Let's now discuss imaging um, when you're suspecting a case of infection of the spine. First thing you get is the radiograph, but keep in mind that radiograph takes about two to three weeks to show the characteristic findings, which are narrowing of the disc space and irregularities of the adjacent uh, vertebral end plates, as we are going to see uh, uh, in the next slide. Also, you can see the osteopenia uh, in cases uh, which have been having the infection of the spine for a long time. So x-rays, the first thing you get, it takes about two to three weeks uh, for the finding to appear, is mainly be to, going to be narrowing of the spine, irregularities, and osteopenia. What other imaging studies that we can do? Technetium bone scan, it will be um, showing the infection as the hot spot of the affected disc. Uh, however, the most commonly used um, and most sensitive and most specific for infection is the MRI. So if you're suspecting an MRI and it's early in the disease um, and the x-ray uh, is negative, um, MRI is the uh, imaging of choice. It's very sensitive uh, imaging study. It's, it becomes positive early in the disease process, not like the x-rays, which take about two to three weeks. And uh, also it can identify if there is an abscess formation, which is an indication for surgical intervention. So this is an 
X-ray for a 14-year-old boy. This patient had a back pain for a few months. He had been described as having muscular back pain, uh, and no X-rays were taken. However, finally, when this patient continued to complain of pain, X-rays was taken, and it shows so obviously how uh, the narrowing of the disc space and the irregularity of the vertebral end the plate. So if you see, this is a normal disc. This is a normal disc also. So you, this is the normal shape of the disc. It has to be wide, uh, and the, the uh, vertebral end plates, um, uh, both the, uh, the inferior end plate of the vertebra above the superior of the vertebra below are um, are, uh, are uh, regular. Um, they don't have any irregularities. If you see this here, the disc space is completely narrowed and even uh, completely obliterated. And you can see here is in uh, areas of osteolysis and osteopenia. And you can see also the irregularities of the uh, end plates. You can see them uh, clearly as you can see in this area. So this is the x-ray picture, um, uh, narrowing and complete loss of the disc space here and also irregularities um, of the uh, end plates. Uh, here is the same picture uh, the, uh, as MRI is taken. You can see obviously here uh, the inc in the T2 uh, images, you can see the increased uptake. So these are the normal vertebra. These are the affected vertebra um, because of the edema from the infection. You can see uh, uh, they have increased um, intensity uh, there. Uh, you can see also in the disc space uh, the uh, destruction of the disc space. So these are the normal discs here, uh, and here there is no normal disc. Uh, this is another example for a patient. They uh, all share the similar story. They usually diagnose with having muscular back pain for a few weeks till an X-ray is taken. And then once X-ray is taken, uh, you can see the characteristics and you can see also these characteristics in the MRI. So if you see, this is a lateral view of the thoracic vertebra. These are normal uh, spaces here. If you see here, uh, this vertebra has um, some sort of collapse. So that tells you that uh, it's not only discitis, there is vertebral osteomyelitis with some collapse of that vertebra and if you see here so this is normal 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 disc space but if you see here you don't see that normal disc space and you see the irregularities here of the vertebra so if you see here this is the superior end plate of this vertebra is very clear the inferior end plate of this vertebra is very clear lines here you don't see that line with uh, complete destruction uh, of the disc space and also because there is element of osteomyelitis in this case you can see this, the collapse here of the vertebra this is the magnification of this picture to see it clearly. Here is the disc space, here is normal. Here is the vertebral end plates. You can see them now how they clear are. But when we come to this one, uh, there is no disc space. There is collapse of that vertebra. There is irregularities of the end plate. Here is the MRI again. It shows you the picture. It shows you the uh, increased uptake uh, for the affected vertebra. It shows you that uh, this is the normal shape of the thoracic vertebra here. Uh, there is a collapse of that vertebra um, uh, causing some mild deformity. Uh, and you can see that the affection here of the disc space also. What about the treatment of infection of the spine? So remember, is osteomyelitis and discitis of the spine are medical conditions. So they are primarily medical condition treated uh, with medications, which is the antibiotic. So you start antibiotic first against Staph aureus, and then you continue according to the culture and sensitivity. As we said, you take cultures by image guided biopsy. And the length of the treatment is usually around six weeks. We monitor this by the clinical response and the ESR. Through these six weeks, the first two weeks, uh, it's better to be with intravenous, intravenous medication. And then after that, if the culture show a good oral antibiotic, uh, you can shift to that. If not, um, you should continue with the IV antibiotic for the whole period using the PICC line. Uh, other modalities for the treatment that used with the antibiotic is wrist, analgesic, and immobilization of spinal orthosis to avoid the development of deformity and to give the patient relief from his pain. So what are the uh, indications for surgical treatment? As we said, um, discitis, osteomyelitis, medical conditions, primarily treated with antibiotic. However, there are some indications um, for, medical, uh, for surgical treatment of uh, these conditions, which if there is no improvement uh, after the appropriate antibiotic, um, uh, and if there is an abscess formation, if there is an epidural abscess, collection of pus, or if the neck uh, osteomyelitis cause market collapse and deformity um, of the uh, vertebra, uh, it will later on need some correction of that deformity. 
Let's speak now about another entity for pain, which is osteoporotic vertebral fractures. Um, what is the etiology for this? Patients who have severe osteoporosis, like osteogenesis imperfecta, or children on steroids, or on anticonvulsant treatment, uh, they can develop severe osteoporosis of their vertebra. As you see here, this is an x-ray for uh, a child that has an uh, inflammatory condition of the bowel. He's on uh, steroids for a long time. He developed osteoporosis, uh, steroids-related osteoporosis of the spine. And you you can see here all the vertebra and uh, are very osteopenic you can see the basically the the amount of bone in each vertebra is minimal uh, and if you see these vertebra this one and this one uh, they obviously show compression fracture it means that uh, they are not acquiring their same uh, rectangular shape they are now becoming compressed markedly because of the osteoporotic compression fracture um, the, you can see here also in the AP these are the two ones this is the normal uh, width of the vert uh, of the uh, vertebra and in these two markedly compressed the treatment is by pain medications and putting this child on bisphosphonate uh, to uh, try to uh, protect him against the osteoporosis the last cause of back pain that we're going to discuss is septic sac sacroiliitis. In this case, the child will present with uh, back pain and hip pain and general size of infection. Uh, so remember, the sacroiliac joint is the joint between the pelvis and the spine. That's why the child, when he gets infection of this uh, joint, he will have both back pain and hip pain. Uh, blood cultures can be positive in about 50% of the cases. However, the disease is mainly diagnosed with MRI or bone scan. So this is an MRI of a child presenting with back pain and hip pain. And if you can see, this is a normal sacroiliac joint. However, there is an increased signal here in this uh, MRI indicating there is an edema uh, around the sacroiliac joint. Most cases are caused by staph aureus, uh, and these conditions can be treated medically without surgical intervention uh, using the appropriate antibiotic. Uh, thank you very much. All my videos are for educational purpose only. Please consult your doctor before any decision. Thank you.